when it comes to troubleshooting, I think now, and as you fit more, and I'm sure a lot of you out there are very prolific scleral lens fitters, and you know this as well, when you come out of optometry school and you you walk into a red eye room, you always kind of assume the worst and you really have no idea what to expect. And as the years go on, as you walk into a room with a patient with a red eye, outside of contact lenses, you probably know what the cause of that red eye is either before you walk in the room or after asking that patient one or two questions. And I think scleral lens troubleshooting kind of becomes the same thing. You know, we can triage so much of the issues that we have just because scleral lenses are predictable. They're comfortable. When everything goes right, the vision's stable, fit is stable throughout the day. And so there's usually very predictable things that can go wrong with scleral lenses. So when there is discomfort with the scleral lens, finding the issue is rather simple. Patients can be very helpful with this. Is it on insertion? Is, is it later in the day? You don't want to see the patient in in the morning or right after they put their scleral lens in. You want to wait until later in the day when that comfort issue starts to occur and, and we'll schedule follow-ups accordingly. If I get a call and they say, I can't wear it past four hours, I say, I want to see you after three hours. So I want to know where it's bearing, where it's lifting, where it's tightening. If it's upon insertion, the first thing I'll always look for is, am I touching the cornea? For cones, that's usually pretty easy. You know where the cone is, use a slit lamp and you try to isolate, where's that cone? Am I vaulting it properly? And if not, and if we're rubbing it, hey, that, that could be a cause for discomfort. There's a big variation in patients as far as what they'll tolerate as far as corneal touch goes. Obviously, as Karen talked about, we don't want to touch the cornea, but uh, chronic GP wearers who were transitioning into scleral lenses aren't going to be too bothered by mild corneal touch and may not be symptomatic to it. Therefore, diagnosing that is much more important behind a slit lamp or an OCT or whatever the case might be. Somebody who's never worn a scleral lens before, but ruling out any kind of touch on the cornea, peripheral, mid-periphery with grafts, you can have some funkiness around the junction that can rub the cornea a little bit. Looking at the edge in 360 degrees is, is really important. 10 years ago, we were lifting and flattening edges as a 360 degree system. And now we're doing that much more specifically because we know that the sclera is typically not spherical. In fact, the vast majority of scleras are not spherical, somewhere in the range of 80 plus percent, if not higher. So making sure you're checking the lateral meridians as well as under the top and bottom lid, ideally in primary gaze to make sure we don't have edge lift or hingement. You tend to find if the discomfort is upon insertion, edge lift is much more likely to be the culprit because of the lid interaction that'll occur with the blink. If it's something that kind of worsens throughout the day, then a tight edge is much more likely to be the cause. So how do we kind of isolate that again? You can use fluorescein underneath the lens and then use a cobalt filter. In fact, that can be helpful to find for, uh, look for gross areas of, of touch. Obviously just a slit lamp and optic section can be helpful. You know, the other thing that we have to watch for too is you may have no corneal touch when you first put the lens in, but after an hour of wear, you could have it. Patients settle at very different amounts and, and very different levels based on the, the stiffness of the conjunctiva and the underlying scleral tissue. So some patients may settle down. It could be comfortable with proper clearance on insertion, but after an hour, four hours, six hours of wear, we could see some rub. This can change as time goes on as well. As, as comfort issues progress throughout the day, as these lenses settle throughout the day, they can start to grip a little bit tighter and you can get a seal off effect from that. And that can be mild and that can be severe. That can come with some discomfort. It can cause a little bit of corneal edema, and it can be sectoral as well. I'll find this a lot to where if you have just even a mild amount, a mild amount of blanching, let's say at three and nine, and, and things look good at six and 12, that's probably going to get worse as the day goes on. As these lenses tighten up, as they sink down into that conjunctiva, the conjunctiva is nice on insertion, it's sponginess kind of fills in all the imperfections. So areas that are fit maybe a little bit too tightly, the edge is a little bit too steep, it'll allow the a cushion for that to dig into, and then the conjunctiva can come with meat areas where there might be a little bit of excessive edge lift. But these changes will kind of compound throughout the day and, and worsen. It's really ideal to identify even small areas of blanching early in a quadrant-specific manner and remedy those as opposed to letting the patient come back in and see my red my eyes getting red and irritated in this one spot, right? In this one quadrant. Blurry vision can definitely be more, a little bit more frustrating and less straightforward. It can be very dynamic. You know, the way these lenses settle throughout the day can change the way the lenses are shaped and therefore induce astigmatism with things like flexure. We also have to remember that the vast majority of the patients that were fitting in these scleral lenses have disease states that need to be monitored as well. So this example here shows obviously a corneal high drop or an acute high drop uh, in keratoconus. If you do a lot of keratoconus, you do see quite a few of these, relatively speaking. You know, I'll get one every other month or so, if not even a little bit more than that. If you're not familiar with them, uh, as the cornea kind of protrudes out, 
and becomes more tatic in diseases like keratoconus, obviously it stretches and thins, and, and eventually it can cause a rupture. And this rupture tends to be brought about by some form of mild trauma, eye rubbing. If you have a patient who has a very thin cornea, especially along the apex of that cornea or a very steep cornea, you know, really stressing, not rubbing your eyes. You really want to give them some eye drop that can just help degrade the need to, to rub the eye to try to avoid things like this from occurring. The, the most likely cause of an air bubble is either not filling the lens up properly, you know, where it bubbles over the top and you get that meniscus or the patient's not pushing the lens onto the eye all the way. If they run into an eyelid, top or bottom, sometimes some of that fluid can leach out that way as well. I like these eye check devices for patients who are getting a lot of air bubbles. It's got a little blue button there that turns on a light with concave mirror and, and that magnifies your eye so the patient can actually view their own eye. Uh, and they can inspect for air bubbles. The problem is if you get a little air bubble, that fluid bubble is going to displace the saline or the tear film over that area of the cornea, and it's gonna dry that area out. So if you let this air bubble sit there for four, six, eight hours, you can remove that lens, put some fluorescent in there, and you'll get this perfect, very bright staining pattern that mimics the shape of that air bubble. And obviously if you have a dry spot that stains significantly, the patient's going to be symptomatic to that. So a good way to triage these, if a patient has had a lens for a month and they call and say, everything's been going great, but today it started out okay. As the day went on, my eye became more red and irritated and uncomfortable. And even when I take my lens out now, it's still uncomfortable. Are you tell them to put some artificial tears in? If it's not better tomorrow, come see me. Infections are possible under scleral lenses, but are extremely uncommon. Flexure occurs when the lens flexes around the flat meridian of the sclera. It's something that tends to increase as the day goes on. So a lot of times you won't notice flexure, whether you're trying to read for it, the patient is not symptomatic to it upon insertion. As the day goes goes on, the lens will slowly kind of sink in and flex more over or around that flat meridian of the sclera and symptoms will increase. And symptoms can include compression and redness along that flat meridian. The symptoms are more visual though. The patients, obviously that lens flexes, you'll get induced astigmatism and patients will be symptomatic to that as either blur or glare at night. After the lens is settled for an hour, four hours, whatever the case might be. You can do keratometry over that lens with your autorefractor. We expect a spherical surface. If you're getting over three quarters of the diopter of delta K, then you can assume that lens is flexing. Or if their overfraction is very spherical upon insertion and then moves to much more toric as the lens settles, again, you can, you can assume flexure there. Moving to a toric haptic is by far the best way to alleviate that flexure the best remedy to this situation is just to improve the relationship between the haptic and the sclera in all four quadrants. pre haptic days, the biggest cause of residual sill was probably flexure. You know, normal, regular cornea patients with high sill, they do great in scleral lenses and we're able to stabilize these lenses well and correct their, their corneal astigmatism. Say they have six diopters of regular, you know, with the rule against the rule oblique corneal astigmatism. They can't stabilize the soft toric very effectively. Scleral lenses offer a lot of relief, but you typically do get some bleed through over about three diopters in most of these patients. And if that's the case, then, you know, again, front surface torics will be indicated. So wetting and deposits, surface wetting and deposits, again, used to be a, a really big scourge and still is in some patients. We have some great options now, which we'll talk about here in a second. But one thing we always try, which was, you know, changing materials you know, sometimes we thought, hey, if they didn't work well in, in a Boston or a Conomac or a Paragon, we'd switch them to one of the others and see if maybe their tear film just worked better. Changing uh, care regimens. Uh, there's even some talk about using conditioners to condition the surface of the lens prior to insertion, making sure not to get any of that into the lens bowl so that those preservatives didn't irritate the eye as the day went on. There was even talk about using DMVs to squeegee the lens on the eye, cotton tip applicators to apply conditioning solution to the surface. Progent is a very, very powerful solvent that can melt a lot of lipids and, and proteins off the surface of contact lenses that worked well. But Really, a lot of this has been alleviated thanks to the advent of Tangible's Hydropeg, which has been a big game changer. Really, and I think there's some benefit for all scleral lens patients, but if you even just use it just as a problem solver, it's an extremely powerful problem solver. Is it replicates the natural mucin layer of the surface of the eye. It coats that lens and allows for a more stable tear film on the surface. It also does a great job of resisting deposits, which can be an issue in some of these patients as well. There are four solutions that are compatible with hydropeg coatings. One thing that's been a really big benefit for patients who really do struggle, you know, they can get three to four months out of a lens before the surface just quits wetting. Hydropeg has helped, but to continue to kind of push that out further, 
Tangible Boost has been a powerful product, but what Boost does is it recharges or rethickens the amount of peg on the surface of the contact lens. It can be a very powerful tool to extend the life of scleral lenses out to the full year. Midday fogging occurs when debris, it tends to be mostly lipid. It can occur right after you put the lens in, it can occur halfway through the day, and it can occur toward the end of the day. But you'll get patients who come in and say, hey, it starts off great, comfort's great all day, my vision starts to get blurry or cloudy after four hours, six hours, 10 hours of wear, and I have to take the lens out and put it back in. If they can take the lens out, basically refill it with fresh saline, put it in, and the, the issue resolves, it's most likely a midday fogging or clouding issue. If they take the lens out, fill it back up, and put it back in, and the vision's still blurry, that's probably a surface wetting issue. The other thing you always want to diagnose, again, with these patients is physiological changes to the cornea. We'll talk more in a second about stromal edema. But stromal edema is something we definitely want to be very careful with in scleral lenses. Making sure that it's not an edematous issue, and, and it is a fogging issue, is important. Obviously, slit lamp exam. Uh, exam is important. Also, if you do that experiment where you take it out, refill it, put it back in, the edema won't heal up immediately. The midday fogging will. So what causes this? You know, we know that stuff has to come from somewhere. So if they have heavy tear film debris, and you notice that even without a scleral lens on, you know, we want to try to find where that's coming from. Dry eye disease, inflammatory eye disease, eyelid disease, blepharitis. If you push in their meibomian glands and you get a bunch of turbid secretions out of there, hey, let's work on that. Warm compresses, Ilux, Lipiflow, IPL, tear care, all of the different solutions we have in the office, warm compresses at home, whatever the case might be, lid scrubs, bluff back, all these things can be very powerful tools because a lot of this stuff comes from the lids and we know that. But we also want to check the fit. If we have an area where debris is getting underneath that scleral lens, we want to alleviate that. We want to remedy that. Excessive clearance in any quadrant. So you see here, we have a lot of debris in this tear layer. Well, if we just make that tear layer a lot smaller, which looks like we have a lot of room to do, less debris can fit in there. So just functional changes can improve the quality of vision throughout the day, even without even touching the eyelids or the source of that debris. So making sure we reduce that post lens tear layer thickness as much as possible, and then really trying to achieve a plano tear lens. And cornea is not something we want to take uh, any kind of chances with. We want to be very aggressive in trying to alleviate it. It can lead to long-term damage in endothelial cells. If it's limbal, it can lead to damage in the limbal stem cells and, and eventual limbal stem cell deficiency. So if you have tight lens syndrome, if the whole lens is sealed off, a lot of times the corneal will become edematous. That's easy. We just fix the fit, right? We just loosen the haptics either 360 degrees or in the appropriate quadrant. We refit the patient, whatever the case might be. Dysfunctional endothelium, again, that's something that is not so much an easy fix, but it's a it's an obvious fix. If you can do cell counts on a patient, great, you can do it. If, if you can't send them to somewhere that can if you can't alleviate the edema to, to rule that out. Other than that, we have to try to change the fit of that lens or the properties of that lens in order to reduce the amount of swelling. There's really three things we can control. We can control the decay of the material that we're using. We can control the thickness of the contact lens and therefore the decay over T. And then we can, can manipulate how thick is that post lens tear layer? How much kind of vault or clearance do we have over the central cornea? And that's important there. And that was, we'll see is, is really where we need to focus our energy because the tear layer itself has a decay of 80. The contact lens itself is going to have a decay of a minimum of a hundred. So the decay over T of that tear layer is the one thing we can manipulate the most excessively clearance over that cornea is going to diminish most significantly the amount of oxygen that gets to the corneal surface. And so that's where we need to kind of point our efforts. The number one thing we should try to do if we notice corneal edema is try to limit the amount of post lens tear layer thickness as aggressively as possible, because that's where we get the most bang for our buck. Conjunctival clasis or prolapse, this is when that kind of negative suction pressure underneath the lens pulls some of the uh, conjunctival tissue up over the limbus. Having that plano tear lens underneath the lens can help even out the forces and, and reduce some of that suction. Excessive limbal clearance or mid peripheral clearance tends to be the biggest culprit here. There are some cases where you do get a little bit of scarring or neurovascularization around that limbal uh, structure. And if you see that, you want to be even more careful to alleviate this. I think this is kind of where a lot of it's going. Diagnostic lenses and diagnostic lens fitting is still very approachable, still very effective, especially if you're not looking to invest in the technology. But as you fit more and more lenses, this prophylometry based fitting is really effective, saves chair time, gives a more customized approach, reduces the amount of need for troubleshooting. Probably the most precise way to fit a lens is the impression based designs. These, they say a tolerance, according to the company, down to two microns. You almost never get anything that has to be adjusted too much with these lenses. But again, people 
will settle differently. People absorb into the conjunctival differently. So even with these designs, as perfect as they are, there still can be some need to, to change them. Obviously, corneas can change over time too in ectatic disease or any other conditions. Thank you.